which is my little boy, which is he? Jean qui pleure ou Jean qui rit? Jean qui rit is my delicate John, the one with the Chinese slippers on, whose hobby horse in a single bound carries me back to native ground. You are listening to the voice of Tennessee Williams reading his poem, Which is My Little Boy? A page from this week's edition of Anthology. This week, we're going to hear two types of poetry albums. On the first record, the classic poetry of yesterday, read by one of today's foremost interpreters of poetry, David Allen. On the second record, we'll hear the poet Tennessee Williams reading from his own works. In the not-too-dim past, the reading of poetry was an accepted part of the social scene. Poetry was read aloud in the parlor. Transient poets were always available in local gathering places. And even on the vaudeville and Chautauqua circuits, recitations were a popular portion of the programs. Today, we hope that the audible enjoyment of poetry is again becoming an integral part of our literary lives. A young man who actually practices what he preaches in the cause of poetry is David Allen, who, since 1940, has been exciting people with the sound of good poetry when his first program was broadcast over a station in Baltimore. David, I see no reason why I should bother reading all the rest of these program notes from the back cover of your new album when you're here in person with us, not in Baltimore at all, but right in New York City. Well, just go on reading those notes on the back cover. We labeled, labored very hard over them. You mean that's the best product, that the, the best of your product, actually, on poetry records? Well, there are some interesting comments, perhaps, on the record that just came out recently. I'm sure that the comments on the records are not as good as the records themselves. Well, thank you. How many records have you out up to this point? We put out two records. This is the second one, and the title of this is No Single Thing Abides. Right? That is. That's right. The newest release is that. And what was your first one called? The first record was 16 Sonnets of William Shakespeare. And that came out about two years ago. You have plans for future records? We do. I think uh, this year, early this year, we'll have Whitman out to help ce celebrate his 100th year of Leaves of Grass. And uh, subsequent records will include love poetry, and I think we'll embrace some of the standard poets and some of the modern poets. Before we talk any more about your records, past, present, and future, let's hear one of your present records, shall we? Well, it'd be very nice. Well, what's, your, what's the poem that you'd like to play? Well, the record, uh, as you mentioned before, is entitled No Single Thing Abides. And uh, perhaps before even discussing the point of the whole album, we should listen to one of the poems. Um, how about this poem by Keats, When I Have Fears That I May Cease To Be? I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain. Before high pilot books in character hold like rich garners the full ripened grain. When I behold upon the night star face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance. And when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love. Then on the shore of the wide world, I stand alone and think, till love and fame to nothingness do sink. I should like to point out before we go any further that the poem you just heard was read by David Allen on his new recording and that David is here in person and the next voice you will hear will be David Allen in person, not on the record. Did you choose these poems yourself, David? Yes. As a matter of fact, I did. Um, one thing I was wondering what you would perhaps comment on was the question of uh, the music. The music on the recordings, you mean? Yeah. 
Did you happen to uh, hear the first record uh, that we put out, the sonnets of Shakespeare? As a matter of fact, you didn't, because you, you used them, I think, on this program. I mean, I've, heard, I've heard part of it, yes. Well, the question of music is always uh, a moot one in terms of poetry. It's a moot one, especially around anthology, because we get mail constantly. Really? No matter what we do, if we play poetry without music, someone is very unhappy. And if we play it with music, then they say, you're destroying the purity of the poetry and so on. Well, what do you think about it? I think it's a very personal thing, just as uh, people relate individually and identify with very individual ways with almost any art form. There's no question in my mind that poetry can stand up by itself. It doesn't need music. But when listening to poetry read aloud, music, I think, plays a function in heightening a dramatic moment in a way that nothing else can. I remember Giancarlo Minotti in a recent article discussed the question of music and how nothing, no other form of art, mm -hmm. can so excite the emotion so quickly uh, intellectually as music can. That's true. Then, in other words, you feel that the, if the music does not heighten the effect of the poetry, better not to have it at all. That's true. Also, uh, the matter of how the music is used is very important. Sometimes it isn't used successfully. And also which music is used. Mm -hmm. The quality of the music and of the poetry, too, I suppose. That's right. When we did the Shakespeare sonnets, we made a point of studying music of that period, of the 16th and 17th century. And our composer, Curtis Beaver, uh, we feel came out with something that had a very good ring of authority of that period in it. What about the next poem that you're going to read for us? You promised us a story on well, this that is one. this is a really interesting poem. It was written in the 16th century by an Englishman bearing the unlikely name of Chidiok Tichborn. This poem is the only one that has been uncovered by this poet. It was written on the eve of his execution. Actually, he uh, was a conspirator and uh, in the court of Queen Elizabeth, and he was arrested and condemned to death. And the day before, night before he died, he wrote a letter to his wife, which contained this poem, which just bears the title, written on the eve of his execution. And uh, it has very interesting quality. Uh, I think almost a modern quality. It's a whole series of paradoxes. I think it's a quite a beautiful poem. One of the most beautiful elegies, I think, in the English language. <laughs> And 
now I live. And now my life is done. David, we think you read these poems beautifully, as obviously many people do. Do you write poetry? No, I don't, Harry. <laughs> then we can't say that you are a poet who is going to perform his own poems. We're going to do that later on in the program, though. You know, we have a Cadman record of uh, Tennessee Williams reading his own works. We, yes. we often do this, and we've discussed music with poetry with you today, which is... I guess that's about number two controversial point among anthology listeners. Number one really is, should poets read their own poems? Perhaps uh, we might get a slightly prejudicial viewpoint from you, but we'll hazard it anyway. What do you think? I think you're right when you say that it's controversial. I think that both the question of music and poetry and the poem, poets reading their own poems are two controversial questions in uh, the field of spoken poetry. Again, as in the case of the music, it's a very personal thing. Um, my feeling is that the art of reading poetry is something that has yet to grow in this country. It once existed uh, in the old days when poetry was only communicated through, uh, through the voice. I myself feel that there should be qualifications for reading poetry as there are for other media of art expression, such as music, such as drama. We don't always have uh, the playwright reading his own manuscript, nor do we have uh, the composer playing the violin, unless he's qualified. I think there's a great deal of historic interest in the question of poets reading their own poetry, and there is a feeling that uh, the poet can interpret his poetry in the terms that he wrote it. I'm not so sure that is always the case. We frequently see a situation where an interpreter in, in dramatic uh, areas can do more in finding nuances, finding meaning, that the originator can't uh, find it in himself to do. I think the originator is frequently self-conscious about his material. So if you want to put me on the autumn of limb, I'll say I think that uh, for the most part there should be standards for the reading of poetry as there is in any other art form. In other words, one should consider the performer first, and if this performer is good and he also happens to be a poet, then let him read his own poetry. Right? Precisely. Of course, I suppose if you're a, of an exhibitionist nature and you can't get anyone to listen to you, one thing to do is to go out and write your own poetry and then say the performer, or the writer should perform, and then they have to listen to you. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> but let's have a comment or two on your next recording before we play it. Nothing much to say. It's a very well-known um, sonnet by Shelley called Ozymandias. And uh, if I can crib from the cover of the jacket of No Single Thing of Binds, Please do. Greatness cannot be decreed, nor can a monument survive the meaning of a man. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Thank you again, David. David, we're pleased to have you here on Anthology with us this Sunday. We're rather curious as to what you do the rest of the time. Do you uh, go about reading poetry one place or another, or do you have a regular rostrum, 
so to speak, on which to mount? Well, not regularly. No, I don't. Uh, poetry Records keeps me pretty busy. I am, as a matter of fact, uh, doing a reading uh, next week, next Sunday in New York City, uh, at the new Grace Rainey Rogers Auditorium at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is the year that everybody is celebrating Whitman, and deservedly, and we're going to do a reading of his very beautiful elegy to Lincoln, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. And original music has been composed for that. Speaking of music. <laughs> very fine. Well, we want to hear one more poem from you. And before we do, David is very reticent about mentioning his recording here. And I want to make it very precise for you listeners before we lose David Allen for today. The record is on Poetry Records. That's the label of the records. And it's called No Single Thing Abides, read by David Allen, which I'm sure is in your record store. And if it isn't, get in touch with David, and I'm sure he can tell you where to find one, right? Harry, I couldn't ask for a more succinct explanation. <laughs> What's the last poem we're going to hear? The last poem is John Donne's No Man is an Island, which is from his Devotions. <laughs> casts not up his eye to the sun when it rises. But who takes off his eye from a comet when that breaks out? Who bends not his ear to any bell which upon any occasion rings? But who can remove it from that bell which is passing a piece of himself out of this world? No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind. And therefore... Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Again, our thanks to David Allen for being with us on Anthology this afternoon, and also our thanks to him for allowing us to play excerpts from his new poetry recording, No Single Thing Abides. Second guest this week, Tennessee Williams, has been recorded by Cadman Records, who, among their albums of modern poets, headline such noted names as Dylan Thomas, E. E. Cummings, Ogden Nash, W. H. Auden, Archibald McLeish, The Sipwells, and many, many more. We'd like to thank Barbara Cohen and Marion Roney for allowing us to bring you today a series of selections from the Cadman album of Tennessee Williams reading from his prose and poetry. Mr. Williams reads first. Two serious poems, Cried the Fox and the Eyes. I run, cried the fox, in circles, narrower, narrower still, across the desperate hollow, skirting the frantic hill, and shall to my brush hangs burning flame at the hunter's door, continue this fatal returning to places that failed me before. Then with his heart breaking nearly the lonely, passionate bark, of the fugitive fox rang out clearly as bells in the frosty dark across the desperate hollow, skirting the frantic hill, calling the pack to follow a prey that escaped them still. The eyes are last to go out. They remain long after the face has disappeared regretfully into the tissue that it is made of. The tongue says goodbye when the eyes have a lingering silence. For they are the searchers last to abandon the search, the ones that remain where the drowned may be washed ashore after the lantern staying, not saying goodbye. The eyes have no faith in too accessible language. For them no occasion is simple enough for a word to justify it. 
Existence in time, not only their own but ancestral, encloses all moments in four walls of mirrors. Close their waiting, open their also waiting. They are acquainted, but they have forgotten the name of their acquaintance. Youth is their uneasy bird, and shadows clearer than light pass through them at times. For waters are not more changeable under skies, nor stones under rapids. The eyes may be steady with that Athenian look that answers terror with stillness, or they may be quick with a purely infatuate being. Almost always the eyes hold on to an image of someone recently departed or gone a long time ago or only expected. The eyes are not lucky. They seem to be hopelessly inclined to linger. They make additions that come to no final sum. It is really hard to say if their dark is worse than their light, their discoveries better or worse than not knowing. But they are last to go out, and their going out is always when they are lifted. Unpublished and available for the first time on this Catman album, the series Some Poems Meant for Music reveal a new and unexpected aspect of Mr. Williams. The verses are light, gaily charming, but with serious undertones. Tennessee Williams reads Little Horse, Which is My Little Boy, Gold Tooth Blues, Kitchen Door Blues, and Heavenly Grass. Which is my little boy? Which is he? Jean qui pleure ou Jean qui rit. Jean qui rit is my delicate John, the one with the Chinese slippers on, whose hobby horse in a single bound carries me back to native ground. But Jean qui pleure is mysterious, with sorrows older than Niger, with all of the stars and all of the moons mirrored in little silver spoons. Which is my little boy? Which is he? Jean qui pleure ou Jean qui rit. Mignon he was, or mignonette, avec les jeux plus grand que lui. My name for him was Little Horse. I fear he had no name for me. I came upon him more by plan than accidents appear to be. Something started or something stopped, and there I was, and there was he. And then it rained, but Little Horse had brought along his parapluie. The tissue violet kept quite dry till he divided it with me. But it was late, and I was lost when Little Horse inquired of me. But have a bark, but cannot bite. And I was right, it was a tree. Mignon he is, or mignonette, avec les jeux plus grand que lui. My name for him is Little Horse. I wish he had a name for me. Now, there's many fool things a woman will do to catch a man's eye. She'll wear a tight shoe. She'll wear a light dress and catch a bad cold, and she'll have a tooth pulled for a tooth of gold. I'm a gold tooth woman with a gold tooth blues, because a gold tooth makes a woman look old. Now, gold in the bank is a wonderful thing, and a woman looks nice with a nice gold ring. But, honey, take a tip, and the tip ain't cold. Your mouth's no place to carry your gold. I'm a gold tooth woman with a gold tooth blues, because a gold tooth makes a woman look old. Some late Sunday morning when you're still in the hay and you want a little love and your sweet man will say with a look that'll turn your heart's blood cold, woman, that gold tooth makes you look old. I'm a gold tooth woman with a gold tooth blues because a gold tooth makes a woman look old. When he don't have a dollar but he must have his drink, he'll sneak up behind you at the kitchen sink and before you can holler, I'm telling you the truth, he'll brain you with a blackjack and pull your gold tooth. I'm a gold tooth woman with a gold tooth blues, because a gold tooth makes a woman look old. My old lady died of a common cold. She smoked cigars and was ninety years old. She was thin as paper with the ribs of a kite, and she flew out the kitchen door one night. Now I'm no younger than the old lady was since she lost gravitation, and I smoke cigars. I feel sort of peaked, and I look kind of poor. So for God's sake, lock that kitchen door. My feet took a walk in heavenly grass all day while the sky shone clear as glass. My feet took a walk in heavenly grass all night while the lonesome stars rolled past. 
Then my feet come down to walk on earth, and my mother cried when she gave me birth. Now my feet walk far and my feet walk fast, but they still got an itch for heavenly grass. The voice of Tennessee Williams on the Cadman album, Tennessee Williams, Selections from His Writings, read by the author.